Welcome to your weekly UAS news update. And this week is week 53. I'm really excited because it's been one year. And if you go back and look at the first episode that we ever recorded, uh, different background, different shirt, different everything, but the news really is still the same a year later. We still talk about the similar topics. And uh, I'm really excited that you guys have been following. I know some of you have been following from the get-go, from the first day, and I'm, I'm really excited to be celebrating one year. So here's to several more years of news update every single Friday. This week, I wanna talk about several things. The first thing is a follow-up to the uh, DJI and Hotel lawsuit that I talked about last week. I wanna talk about an article that DJI published about does DJI store your data? And we'll talk a little bit about an incident that happened, actually an accident that happened, and uh, kinda of see what the process was and see what kind of data you have and what kind of data gets collected by DJI. I wanna talk about two surveys that are related to drones. One is gonna be the results of a survey, is one is a survey that maybe you would wanna do uh, if you're part of a special group. And then the last thing is I wanna talk about the TFR over Florida and kinda of talk about TFRs in general and give you a little bit of a reminder of what they are and what they look like. So let's get started. The first thing this week is a follow-up to the lawsuit with DJI and Hotel. Uh, there's a patent war going on right now. If you didn't watch last week's episode, basically Hotel uh, reported last week that they claim that the sales of the DJI drones is going to stop by summer. Uh, there was a, uh, a judge from the International Trade Commission that ruled in favor of Hotel, and they think that the result is gonna be that DJI will not be able to sell or import any drones in the future. Now, I wanna make a correction, because last week I said something that was incorrect. Uh, I did read through the patent, but I kind of read too quickly, actually kind of uh, confirmation bias, if you want. I read what I wanted to read because I had read something else in a different article. The, uh, the patent is not about the legs that fold. The patent is actually about the fact that the propellers uh, get fixed and get attached to the motor in different directions, depending on which, uh, which leg you're on and also the color coding that's on it. So that was kind of what this was about. And, uh, and I made a mistake, so I'm making a correction here. Now, it looks like there's actually three patents that are uh, being in pl at play in this whole thing right here. And uh, the first one is about obstacle avoidance. The first one is about the propellers in itself, the blades like I just talked about. And the last one is about the clamping system uh, of attaching the battery to the drone. Now DJI lawyers are striking back and they're saying that there was uh, a case about a week ago where the Patent Trial and Appeal Board, the PTAB, uh, earlier this month basically came back and said that some of these patents are unpatentable basically saying that, well, these are not enforceable. So ultimately it's gonna be up to the, uh, the International Commission to basically make a decision on this and make a final ruling. So it's still open, it's still up in the air. One side is saying that they're gonna stop the other one from selling and then one side is saying this is nonsense and gonna happen. So I'll keep you guys posted and see what happens in the future. The next article I thought was interesting. I actually read it two weeks ago, but I didn't have room to fit it in, so I want to mention it this week. This is an article that was posted on DJI's website, and it shows a closer look at what kind of data DJI actually collects from its customers. The article was written by Brendan Schulman. He's the VP of Policy and Legal Affairs at DJI. And Brendan is a big advocate, by the way, for uh, the drone community. So um, I enjoy reading his uh, stuff because he knows what he's talking about. And not only that, but he's uh, proven over and over again that he's been a, a force behind this industry. Now, the article gives gives us some insight as to what happened with the investigation of a DJI drone that collided with a US Army Black Hawk helicopter. And that happened back in 2017, in September of 2017. There was an unidentified drone that collided with a helicopter over the, uh, the river over Coney Island in New York. And there were no casualties, nothing really happened, but they did find a piece of the drone inside of the helicopter. And uh, when they recovered that, they were actually able to find an arm and a motor sitting on top of it. And um, because uh, DJI has serial number on all these parts, DJI was able to go back and find the drone that this belonged to. And because they actually had sold the drone to that person directly, then they were actually able to identify who the person was. Now this happened not because, uh, this happened because the NTSB, who's in charge of the National Transportation Safety Board, who's in charge of doing investigation, uh, legally collected that data from DJI. DJI had to produce that data because it was available. Um, with that being said, 
the the only reason why DJI had that data, by the way, is because they sold the drone directly to that person. Otherwise, they would have no idea who it was. Now, because the operator had not agreed to share his flight logs with DJI, then really DJI had nothing to do on their side. They could not collect that data, they could not pull that data and provide it to the NTSB. So instead the NTSB went to that gentleman's house and knocked on the door and said, hey, we want your logs. So this person eventually uh, voluntarily provided the logs. I don't know how voluntary it was, quite frankly, but he provided the logs to DJI. He could have destroyed them, quite frankly. Um, turns out he was flying about 300 feet over the river and then hit RTH, it looks like, and then the drone came back and then on the way back hit the uh, Black Hawk helicopter. Um, the bottom, of the, the bottom line of the story is you kind of decide what kind of data you want to share with, uh, with DJI and what, they, what kind of data DJI is going to be recording. Uh, you can turn this off in your settings and at that point, then if something happens, then DJI won't be able to pull that data. Now, th I'm not saying that this is what you should be doing, by the way. Um, I'm kind of glad actually that this person gave the logs. This is all about safety, okay? He did something stupid. Somebody could have died, quite frankly, but this person provided the information to the authorities and then we can all learn from it, quite frankly. We can all learn that, well, there are things that we shouldn't be doing, like flying in areas that are not legal. So I'm saying all this. I just want you to read the article if you're interested in this. I know DJI has been in the spotlight. I'm not by any means trying to defend them. I'm trying to provide some information in here. I fly DJI drones um, and, uh, and I enjoy them, quite frankly. So I think they have, they have a good product. Now, the next thing that I want to talk about is the two drone surveys. Now, one of them is not really a survey anymore. I want to share the results of the survey, but it was conducted by Drone Life. Drone Life is a platform that uh, does drone news, and I, and I highly recommend that you follow them, by the way. Um, I get an email every once in a while when an article comes out. Actually, a lot of this news that you get in this, uh, in this um, uh, video every week comes from Drone Life because they're on top of it and they provide, I think, unbiased information. So, highly recommend them. But anyway, they had a survey that was asking uh, how and how much do commercial drone pilots uh, price for their services. And uh, if you look at the results of the survey, it's kind of interesting. They had four different categories and they found out that 0% of the people that responded are pricing their, uh, their services at $100 an hour or less, 0%. 23% of them are pricing between $100 and $200 per hour. And then 15% are charging more than $200 per hour. Also, what they found in there is that the rest of them, 62%, are actually providing drone services, but they're not charging per hour. Instead, they're charging as part of a more comprehensive quote. So I thought these numbers were interesting. I get this question a lot every single day. Uh, how should I charge my, uh, my services and how much should I charge for my services? And, uh, and, and by the way, I have a drone business course where I go over this. I can uh, help you with figure out how you should be charging if you want to charge per hour or per uh, mission or whatever it is. So uh, if you need help with this, that we have a course for this, but that's not the reason I'm mentioning this. Uh, I think this is important. You need to understand what your value is and you need to make sure that you price correctly compared to your customers, uh, compared to what your customers want to pay. So. The next thing I want to talk about is the survey, the second survey. This is a survey that is being put on by drone responders, and this is for public safety operators. So if you're a public safety operator, uh, drone responders is trying to better understand the needs of responders. And they have a quick survey that you can fill out, and they're just trying to find out how you're being affected by all of this that's going on right now. Now, if you don't know about drone responder, uh, they're one of the, if not the largest, um, public safety group out there that is going to take care of you and, and help you throughout this process. A lot of really good information if you become a member. I highly recommend if you're into public safety that you give them a look and, uh, and join. And uh, they do a lot of really good advocacy for drone operators in general and public safety operators uh, more specifically. The last thing I want to talk about is a TFR over Florida. Now, this is supposed to happen on Wednesday. Uh, which is the day that I record this, uh, this news update. So, but I've lived in Florida long enough, very close to this area that I know that uh, uh, launches are going to be delayed, can be delayed, and it happens all the time. So there's a chance that this could be extended up until 
uh, this gets released. Now, with that being said, it doesn't really matter. I want to talk about TFRs in general, and then this is a good example of one right here. Now, there's a launch coming up at the, at the Kennedy Space Center. Uh, there's a TFR put in place, and this is a standard TFR for this kind of event. It's a 30 nautical mile in radius TFR, and that starts at the Kennedy Space Center, and it expands. So it expands all the way down to Melbourne and all the way up to Daytona Beach. So it's a really large area where you can't fly. You can't fly at all, so you have to be very careful. Drone, airplane, whatever it is, stay away from that area. The uh, reason I'm very familiar with this is because I went through a lot of these during my flight training because I trained in Melbourne, which was basically the airport was split in half because we were almost exactly 30 miles away from, uh, from that area. So uh, this is actually pretty cool. This is the first manned space flight since 2011 in the US. This is a big deal. This is a big event. Um, so uh, there's a lot of really good reminders out there for NOTAMs and TFRs. I want to make sure that you understand what those are and make sure that you check before every single one of your flights. This is a really good reminder. You know why? Because you face uh, criminal charges, you face civil penalties, and the revocation of your certificate. They even said on the website that they will shoot down anything that <laughs> looks suspicious. So uh, don't please don't go flying out there and give everybody else a bad reputation. Um, my question to you is how do you check NOTAMs? How do you check TFRs to make sure that you're legal to fly before every single flight? So share your workflow with me. What app do you use? And then hopefully other people can read those comments and get some ideas on how to do this. So this is all I have for this week. I hope that you enjoy this uh, session. Again, one year anniversary, really excited. And uh, as always, please subscribe to the channel. You'll get notification when I post new videos every week. We're ramping up on the number of videos that we're gonna post on this channel. A variety of different videos actually are coming up, not only this news update. And, uh, and like the video, leave a comment. I always love interacting with you guys. And uh, this is all I have for this week. I'll see you guys next week.